Okay. So what we have for centripetal force, right? When we were talking yesterday, yesterday we were talking about a car going around a flat curve, right? So if we're looking at the back side of the car, we have the car and its wheels, right? It's an impressive car, I know. And then that's the road bed. So now it's sitting flat on it. And we said, what were the forces that were present on a car that's moving around a flat road? Friction. We had friction. And which way was friction acting? Towards, Towards the, center. the center, right? That was our centripetal force. If there were no force of friction, then the car would move to the outside of the curve. And so our car essentially, if this were the little white stripes that are going down the road, it would be moving away from the white stripes. And so the white stripes relative to the car would move to the left. And so the frictional force is going to oppose that motion. And so it's going to move the car, try and keep the car from moving to the right. Questions on that? That sounded a little bit more confusing than I think it needed to be, but that's okay. All right, so if our car tries to move to the right, the force of friction forces it back to the left. And that's why the force of friction is our centripetal force. That sounded a little better. All right. So we said yesterday also that weight in this case was straight down. And our normal force was in opposition to our weight. Right? Because our car is not flying into the air and it's not crashing through the ground. And so we know our force of friction is equal to mv squared divided by radius, where our velocity is the velocity of the car. That's the tangential velocity. And R is the radius of the curve, the imaginary circle that outlines the curve is the radius of the curve. Okay, So this is the radius of the curve, that's the speed of the car, and that's the force of friction. Right? Uh, and we did some other stuff with it, but we're going to basically leave it there, and we're going to talk about what happens if our car wants to increase this velocity. We want our car to go faster around that curve than the force of friction will, will support. Because remember, our force of friction is coming from the weight of the car and from the basically how sticky the road surface is with the tires. Right? So making the car go faster does not change the amount of friction. Right? Making the car fast go faster does not change the amount of friction. So if you want the car to go faster around the curve and you want R to remain the same, then something else has to happen. You have to introduce a new force. Okay, and that's what we're going to be doing today. So the way that we accomplish this in the real world is instead of trying to like tie a rope to the car to add a tangential force with tension or some other crazy like retro rocket firing to the right hand side of the car to add another thrust vector to the inside of the curve, which you could do that, but it's unrealistic. Okay, unless you're like making spaceships for you know, intergalactic highway or something. Uh, it's way easier just to change the surface of the road. Okay, in fact, I was in uh, South Texas uh, this weekend and uh, I was driving down this one of the highways and uh, I, I go to the, the coast all the time with my son and, uh, and over the years they've changed this one particular road. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons why they've changed it, but they just keep increasing the speed limit, essentially. Uh, and so as you're driving down this road, it goes into a curve, and it's, it seems like a fairly gentle curve, but if you're on rural roads in the state of Texas, they allow you to go pretty darn fast. Okay? And over the years, it's gotten faster and faster. When I first started going, it was like 45, right? And then it jumped up to 55. And then it was 60 and 65. And now it's 75, right? And I would like to say that the lowest common denominator car out there, the cheap cars, have all gotten better over the years, and so they can all make that curve. But the fact of the matter is they haven't, right? So they had to do something. Now, you could do a couple of things. Remember, according to our equation, if tangential velocity increases, right, the speed limit of the car, and the force of friction doesn't increase because your car is just as bad as it was before, you got the same type of tires, 
then what's the only thing you could do according to this equation? Increase radius? You could increase the radius. If I increase r, I could increase v. And everything would be good. There's one problem with increasing v. Okay? There's a farmer, and he owns this field. And farmers are really, really particular about their farms. They don't like giving up their farms, right? And they don't like giving up pieces of their land either through eminent domain, okay? Uh, so let's say, for instance, maybe that farmer served on the county board and he really, really, really didn't want to give up his farm. So he said, no, I'm not giving up any of my land either on either side of the road. And this happens all the time. This is not something I'm just making up, okay? And so now... What is the county going to do? Because they don't have the votes to de you know, declare that they need to have that land and just take it, right? So then what are they going to do? They still want to increase the speed limit. Well, the only thing that they can do is change the surface of the road, right? They could either make the road surface stickier, but there's a problem with making the road surface stickier. When you do that, what ends up happening is the road surface becomes softer. It's easier to mess up, and they don't last as long. So they don't really want to do that either. So what they do is they go ahead and they introduce a new force, and they introduce that force by banking. Okay? They take that curve, and instead of being flat now, now they make it sloped. They slope it so that now, use your imaginations... Thanks. Uh, it's taken me a couple of years to learn how to draw it that way, but but it's so now they bank it around to where the car can actually go around the curve, and it can still make it at the higher speed limit. Okay. Now, in this case, they're just using the bank to increase the amount of friction or the amount of centripetal force that there was. Because the frictional force remains the same. So they're just working on the difference. Right? That's really difficult to do at this, this level of physics. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to assume the other extreme, which is actually easier. We're going to assume that what would the bank have to be, what would theta have to be in this case, if there were no friction? Okay? What would theta have to be if there were no frictional force? So now all of our force, all of our centripetal force is now coming from that banked curve. Okay, it's coming from the road bed. So let's look at what's going on in our car as it goes around the surface. This is why we're doing it though. Okay, this is an engineering application. So now we have our road bed. It's now at some, some angle theta. Our car is sitting on a roadbed like so. Right? If the car weren't moving forward, then the car would slide to the inside of the roadbed. Because there's no friction. Remember we played the this is no friction game? Right? So if it didn't have this forward motion, this inertia trying to make it move tangentially then it would slide down. But it doesn't because it does have this tangential you know, tendency, this inertial tendency to drive it to the outside of the curve. All right? And that offsets the force of gravity. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right? But let's just talk about what's actually making the car go around the curve. Okay? What is actually making the car go around the curve? What is supplying the force to the inside of the curve? Okay, he's absolutely correct. Okay, it's the normal force. It's the road itself that's pushing on the car, and the road is pushing the car to the inside. Gravity is trying to pull the car down. Okay, gravity in this case is pulling downwards. The roadbed does split gravity up so that you have a component of gravity pulling downwards, right? But, and then you have a component of gravity pushing upwards or actually back into the road surface that way. That's absolutely true. Okay? But 
that's not what's causing the car to go around the curve, right? What's causing the car to go around the curve is that normal force, right? There's a normal force that's being presented to us. And it's the component of the normal force that's directed to the x-axis that's actually providing our centripetal force. Questions on that? So what we're talking about earlier when we talk about objects on an incline, where we had a box sitting on an incline, and then we rotated our free body diagram so it made more sense. We rotated it theta degrees so that now we had... Let's see, I'm not used to rotating it this way. So, so now we have weight is stated degrees rotated, and then our normal force is straight up and down. Why did, we, why, why did we rotate our free body diagram like this? Why did I tell you we did that? Oh, because the normal force, it's like, it seems like that it's opposing like the surface. So it's making more sense to make more sense that it's going upwards. Right. In this case, our normal force, our normal force, what it's acting as, so this is a box that's sliding down an incline. The normal force is just it's just trying to keep the box from falling through the surface. Right? What's making the box actually slide down the surface is a component of weight. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves what action is taking place. The action in this case of a box sliding down the surface is a component of weight that's pulling it down. The normal force is not doing anything. The normal force is just offsetting that weight. And so that's why we shifted it around so it made more sense. This is a different situation. So we try and leave this logic behind for a moment, and now we're going to analyze this situation. In this situation, the object is not sliding down the surface. Now the object is remaining stationary on that surface. It's not moving down, it's not moving laterally on that surface. Now what's happening is our object is staying at that position, but it's moving around in a circle. And so this component of our normal force is what's providing that force. It's pro providing our centripetal force. So this is our normal force in the x direction. Okay, so our normal force in the x direction, like was said earlier, is going to be our centripetal force. And centripetal force is mass times the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. This is just a looking at what's going on in the diagram. This is a logic statement that our normal force is providing our centripetal force. If our normal force doesn't provide our centripetal force, then our object moves to the outside of the curve and, you know, flies off into the farmer's field. And everybody's sad, right? If our normal force in the x direction is more than our centripetal force, then what happens? If our normal force in the x direction is more than what's necessary to keep the car moving around the curve, then what does the car do? It then it moves into the field, right? And the farmer doesn't want that to happen either because then that wipes out his crops, right? So the farmer want, wants these two things to be equal to each other. Questions on that? So this is just a statement of logic, right? What else do we know to be true? Bless you. What is the other component of the normal force doing? If we have a component uh, in the x direction, it's, 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 it's countering the weight of the Right. Our normal force in the y direction, that's keeping the object from slipping down the roadbed. Right? This component of the normal force is opposing weight. So I can also say that the normal force in the y direction is equal to gravity. If this normal force were greater than the force of gravity, it would fly off into space. That doesn't happen. And if gravity were greater than that component of the normal force, it would crash into the roadbed 
and that doesn't happen either, hopefully. So we know that these two should also be equal to each other. So now we have two statements of fact. Okay? So those are just two statements. Now, we need to know what that normal force is. Right? So how do we get the normal force if we want to know the x component of the normal force? We know what the y component of the normal force is. Right? We can use our trigonometric functions. So let's analyze it geometrically so that we can figure out where this is all going to work out at. Here we have our car. We're going to do a free body diagram of this thing. Right? So my car the forces that are present on the car. We have weight acting in the vertical plane. We have the normal force. It's acting perpendicular to the surface of the road. And then we have the plane itself. And we know that this angle between the roadbed and the horizon is theta degrees. So what I also know is that if I draw another line parallel to this line, I'm just doing a geometric proof to show you where we get this angle from. Okay. What do we know? Which of these angles is equal to theta? Well, we know that angles that share the same side Okay, of two parallel lines that are cross-cut have the same measure. So I know that angle is also theta degrees. That's true. Right? We also know this. Right? That the force normal in the Y makes a 90 degree angle with this cross-cutting line, with that parallel line, excuse me. These two lines are parallel to each other. So I know that this angle here is the complement of theta. Everybody okay so far? All right. So if that's true, and this is also 90 degrees on the other side, then this angle between FNY and FN must be theta degrees. Just using the definition of complementary angles. Why is that one at the bottom? Why not this one? Yeah. Well, we could do it another way, right? Uh, we know this if this angle is theta degrees, this angle is also theta degrees, right? Mm -hmm. This normal force here is always perpendicular to the roadbed, right? So that's a 90 degree angle there. So if you have theta here, this angle is its complement, which also means that that angle must be theta degrees. So however you get to that proof, we know that this angle here is theta, okay? The angle between the normal force and the y component is theta, and that's important because if we know that, then we can use our trigonometric functions to figure it out, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of all of this stuff, and I'm just gonna make it clean lines so that we have, so it makes more sense. So again, we're gonna go back so we went from lifelike to geometric land to now back to free body diagram land, right? So now we have our normal force in the y direction. We have our normal force itself. We have normal force in the x direction. And we have weight directed down. And we know this angle here is theta. 
which we got from the angle of the road bed. Everybody okay? Right? We also said, logically, that the y component of the normal force is equal to weight, which makes sense now that we look at our free body diagram. And we know that our normal force in the x direction is providing our centripetal force, which also makes sense when we look at this picture. Question so far. All right, so the question is, what is our normal force equal to? Well, our normal force in the y direction is equal to our normal force times which trig function? Cosine. Cosine, right? Because their normal force in the y is the adjacent side. So you're absolutely right. So I can say that the, my normal force in the y direction is equal to my normal force times the cosine of theta. Which also happens to be equal to mass times gravity. And then we know that the normal force in the x direction, if this was Fn cosine theta, then we know that the normal force in the x direction is equal to the normal force times the sine of theta, which is not equal to m times g, so please don't write that. But it is equal to mv squared divided by radius. So now I have two two equations. Oh, quick question. Uh -huh. um, I instead of using f of n sine theta, I ended up using f the f of n y, which is n times g, and tan of the angle. Would that work? Tan theta. Mm, you could, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. You can use that. Uh, w the next part that I'm going to do might complicate yours. This is going to look slightly different than mine but mathematically you're still going to end up in the same place if you do the derivation correctly. Okay. His question was, do you have to use cosine, could you use tangent? And kinda is the answer. All right. Now, what I'm going to do now, since I have these two statements of fact, all right, we always need to remember that what is causing this Essentially, what's causing the normal force? Essentially, it's weight, right? Essentially, what's causing the normal force is weight. And what did I tell you about how the force of weight, whenever the force of weight is providing the effect, right? What did I tell you will happen to mass in the equation? It cancels out. Because remember, gravity affects everything the same. Okay? It does not exert the same force on everything. Okay? It doesn't pull on everything the same, but the effect is the same on everything. Right? So what I'm going to do, so because remember, all of this long explanation is so that we could figure out what the angle of the roadbed would have to be. That's what we want to do. We want to figure out what the angle of the roadbed would have to be. So what I'm going to do is... To help with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take these two functions and I'm going to divide Fn sine theta mv squared divided by radius by this function. What that's going to do for me is it's going to eliminate mass from the equation. It's also going to eliminate the normal force. Because right now, I have multiple unknowns. I don't know about mass and I don't know about normal force. Okay, But I don't need to know normal force, nor do I need to know mass, because it's all being derived from gravity. So I can solve for theta by eliminating mass and normal force. You can do that through either process of either through substituting or <coughs> through dividing one equation by the other. So that's what I'm... I, I choose to divide because it makes more sense to me. I'm going to extend my paper, because I can do that with an Elmo. So here we go. All right. I'm going to take Fn sine theta equals mv squared divided by r, and I'm going to divide that 
by Fn cosine theta equals mg. And I want to figure out what that comes out to. So now I need to remember my rules for simplifying complex fractions because that's what I have. First of all, I have normal force on the bottom and on the top, so I can cancel the normal force, which was the point of this. I have the sine of theta over the cosine of theta, and so what in trig class, what postulate tells you what that comes out to? That's tangent, right? That's the definition of tangent. So the tangent of theta, which is the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta, is equal to, and now I've got to simplify all this stuff over there. Right? I have mass on the bottom. I have mass on the top. So the mass is cancel. Okay. Now what? Well, now I have the velocity squared, the tangential velocity. It's in the numerator of the fraction that's in the numerator. And so what, what do I have to do in order to simplify that? I just leave it in the numerator. So that stays in the numerator of the greater fraction. This r, however, is in the denominator of the fraction that's in the numerator. And so if I think back to math class, I learned this rule a long time ago. And I had to relearn it when I first started studying this stuff. So if you don't remember it, it's OK. But if you have something in the denominator of the fraction that's in the numerator of the greater fraction, then it drops down in the denominator of the greater fraction. <sighs> Don't make me say that twice. So the R drops down, essentially. And then the G, which is in the denominator of the greater fraction anyways, it stays in the denominator. So I get G. So this is what I end up with. I end up with tangent theta equals the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius of the curve times g. And so if I want to solve for theta, then I just take the inverse tangent of the whole thing. And I get this equation. And what this equation does is it says that for any given curve of radius r and for any tangential velocity, I can figure out what the roadbed's angle has to be, theta. Now, not quite done. Almost done, I swear, I promise. And then we'll do something a little bit more entertaining. What if... What if we got a guy who can't quite go this velocity, right? So his car is just a little bit lamer than the average car, right? What would happen to him as he goes around our curve? If his velocity isn't high enough, what happens to him? Then he slides down, right? He goes into the farmer's field. We don't want that to happen, right? So is there something we could do to the road surface without changing what the surface of the road is actually made out of to compensate for people with really lame cars or old people who like to drive really slow? You could decrease the friction of the surface, but we said we weren't going to do that because we're not going to like make multiple surfaces as we go around the curve. We could decrease the angle, and that's exactly what they do. Instead of making road beds that look like this, because they don't look like that, mostly, you end up with things that look like that, where you have a decreasing angle. So little Johnny, who drives the normal speed limit, he stays about midway through the curve. People who drive too fast, they can go up to the upper portion of the curve. And people who just drive really, really slow, they're on the bottom portion of the curve. And the curve automatically adjusts to your driving style. So that's something that they can do so that you know they can allow for a range of speeds for that particular curve because they know people are not going to go at the posted speed limit. It's just a fact. 
engineers don't even drive at the posted speed limit, and they're rule followers. Okay, just as a general rule, I'm just okay. Now, all right, uh, moving on. So let's talk about something that's called non-uniformly accelerated motion. Non-uniformly accelerated motion. Okay, one of my favorite examples uh, is this. Some of the more astute students have asked, why do I have the tile back in the, oh, in the room? And the answer is because, I want to show you this demonstration, but they lowered the ceiling on me, which is always bad because then it messes up all my demonstration. <laughs> and I took out a couple of ceiling tiles. And so I learned to move the ceiling tile back. Wait, did you actually did order it? Yeah. I didn't go to the scene. I didn't go to the scene. These little things are just tied up to the, the actual ceiling oh. by by wires, and so they made the wires longer and the whole ceiling drops down. Oh. It's what they call a drop down ceiling. <laughs> so this is fake ceiling. It's not real. It's not a real ceiling. <laughs> if you crawl across it, you fall through. <laughs> okay. So, oh, I know. Uh, how fast do I have to make this go so that I don't make a big old mess? If I don't go fast enough, what happens? The water's going to stay. We all get a shower. <laughs> now, sometimes, some years, I do end up showering people in the front row. See, what you don't understand is this is the splash zone. <laughs> so people who sit in the front row in physics class are a little bit braver than the average bear. And he moves his artwork. <laughs> but if I get it going fast enough, and I don't hit the ceiling, <laughs> <laughs> then I don't make a splash. Right? So the question is, how slow could I make it go without making... Because I can make it go really fast, and then the water, right, through inertia, because the water wants to go sh splashing out, or when it's up here, the water wants to go and hit the ceiling. Right. So if I make it go really, really fast, it just stays in the bucket. But if I make it go slower and slower, then <laughs> I slow it down. The question is, how slow can I make it go before people, or before the water falls out? Take a deep breath, sir. <laughs> it's very heavy. Trust me. This is why. Oh, I know that. I was working on lats last night. Okay, not really. Uh, no, I've been cutting for like a year and a half. I'm finally down to a level where I can actually start building muscle again. That's another story. Uh, so now my shoulders are all tired. So the question is, what's the slowest speed I can possibly go before the water falls down? Or a more, not necessarily a practical example, but what's the slowest the roller coaster can go and keep everybody in the car without them falling down and suing you? Or at least their family suing you. Right? or any other situation you can think of. How fast does the little dryer wheel have to rotate in order to dry, dry your clothes effectively? Right? Because if the dryer spins too fast and the clothes get stuck to the outside of the drum and then they all get all wrinkled, they'll dry, but they get all wrinkled and nasty. Right? So if the, you don't want the clothes to get stuck to the outside of the dryer as it's rotating around, right? What's the whole point of it rotating around in the first place? Because you want to lift them up. You want to throw them into the air. Right? So then they fall down. And in the process of falling down, and they hit the bottom of the dryer, and they get lifted back up again, you blow hot air through it. 
And so as they're going through the air, you're blowing hot air and you're cooling them down. You're, you're, you're uh, heating them up, actually. And you're taking, it's like taking a hair dryer and blowing them, right? If they all get stuck to the outside, then they dry, but they dry all wrinkled. So you want them to go up, but you don't want them to go all the way around. So the question is how fast you have to make things go in order to do that sort of stuff. This is what they call non-uniformly accelerated motion. Because when you are moving around in a circle like my bucket was, that's my bucket, handle, handle, right? So now my bucket is moving around and the water is moving around with the bucket. What are the forces that are present on the bucket slash water? Okay, so gravity is acting on the bucket. But gravity always acts which way? Down. 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 So weight is always down. Whether you like it or not. Or up if you live in Australia. All right. What makes the water go around? Because gravity is not what's making the water go around in this case. Right? And inertia is not making the water go around because inertia is trying to make the water go splash everybody in the splash zone. I would say tension, but it's not necessarily tension. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, no, because I, the tension of my arm is making the bucket go around. That's true. But my the, arm is not touching the water. The normal force of the water. The bucket. Oh, the, bucket. No, the bucket. The bucket is making the water go around. And more specifically, it's the normal force from the water pressing up against the bucket due to inertia. The bucket pushes back by Newton's third law, exerts a force on the water, equal but opposite, and it causes the, the, water, or causes the water to you know, move around in a circle. So I actually have the normal force is what's causing the water to move around in a circle in most cases. So which direction is a normal force always pointed in in this center. case? The to the center-ish. Well, so is the normal force always changing because at one point it's also fighting gravity and the uh, inertia of the water, and then at the top is just gravity's helping it? Uh, the magnitude of the normal force is always changing, yes. Okay. If we free by di body diagram each position of our bucket, what we'll see is that on the bottom, weight is working in opposition to our normal force. When it's here, weight is working neither in opposition nor as an aid. So they're on different planes. Uh, this one, our weight is aiding the normal force. And this one again, we have the normal force and weight being independent of each other. So I could... Now, what is our what was the function of the normal force in this case? It was to act as a centripetal force. As long as the bucket provided enough normal force to the water... To make the water move in a circle, it continued to move in a circle. So I know that in order for this little trick to work, that my normal force has to equal mass times velocity squared divided by radius. If your normal force is greater than the centripetal force, then the water flies into the center of the circle and makes me all wet. And that never happens. Okay? Unless I go too slow at the top. Okay, but that's another story and we'll get to it. So I know that on both sides, on left and right side, my normal force is equal to my centripetal force. That's a fact, Jack. On the bottom case though, now I have my normal force minus my weight. That's going to be equal to my centripetal force. So my normal force is going to be equal to the centripetal force plus the weight. If I just do a little algebra ninjutsu there. All right. So then at the top part, I have my normal force plus the weight is equal to mass times velocity squared divided by radius. OK. 
Okay? Now, what's the minimum amount of normal force that I can ever have on that water? W. What's the minimum amount of normal force? Well, the minimum amount would be zero. No normal force. Right? The only time where you can have no normal force is at the very, very top. And why is that? Well, that's because if the centripetal force is equal to weight, then you don't need a normal force. At the very, very top, if I go slow enough, then the water naturally wants to keep falling down, essentially. Right? But it also had that X component, and so the path of that water at the very top is towards the center of the circle. So if I go slow enough, there is no normal force, and you can feel this. If when you do this with an object, especially a heavy object, Right? At the top, there's less pressure on your arm than at the bottom. At the bottom, there's a lot of pressure, and then you got all the way to the top, and then all the way to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you've got more pressure on your arm because your arm is providing the normal force, essentially. Right? So at the top, you can actually have no force on your arm if you go slow enough. But if you go too slow, then weight never changes. Weight is a function of gravity. So if you go too slow, now the weight is greater than this centripetal force, because this is a function of velocity. So if this is greater than that, what happens to the object? Well, the water falls down. And it accelerates downwards and makes me wet. Okay? So what I want to know, to find the minimum velocity necessary to keep that thing moving in a circle, what I have to do is I have to set weight equal to the tangential velocity of this thing. And not equal to the tangential velocity, but equal to the centripetal force of that thing. That's how you find the minimum velocity velocity necessary to make the car to make the car or the per people in the you know roller coaster or the water going around in the bucket. Uh, so right here to find out the slowest velocity, you just then I would say that W is equal to mv squared divided by radius. Because this is the slowest, this is the lowest amount of centripetal force that you can ever have. Because any less than that will mean that weight will win and the weight will accelerate the stuff downwards. Okay? The normal force will always be greatest at the bottom. Because the normal force at the bottom is always equal to weight plus mv squared divided by r. And the normal force is always equal on... <coughs> I can't even think of how to say this. The sides? It's not really the sides. But halfway up on either side of your vertical plane. Okay. Those normal forces are equal then. At no other times are the normal forces equal to each other. You all have a good day. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Do some math and try and figure out what the slowest speed is for like your arm. One meter. Well, okay, well, what?